Good morning. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 1 through 14. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I'm not an impossible apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Well, last week we began, um, we sort of resumed a study of, of 1 Corinthians, but we also sort of started a, a six-part series within the bigger study of, of 1 Corinthians where we're looking at freedom. We're looking at what is often referred to as Christian liberty. We looked last week at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 where, where Paul sets forth the principle of, of elevating the needs of others and the well-being of others above our own personal rights, our own personal freedoms. The context to which Paul, into which Paul is applying this principle is, is encouragement of mature Christians to be careful that their right to eat whatever they want not hinder the faith of those whose faith may be weaker. And, and so the immediate setting has to do with eating meat that has been sacrificed to false idols. Because that practice um, on the part of mature Christians could be hindering the faith of those who are, who are less mature because they would, they would equate eating this meat with actually worshiping these idols. Well, Paul basically is saying Listen, you know, technically you are free, but please don't let the exercise of your freedom become a stumbling block to other people. In other words, put the well-being of others above your exercise of your rights. And so, last week we covered all of chapter 8, but Paul's discussion of this issue continues into chapters 9 and 10 as well, and that's why this is going to take us a total of six weeks to kind of move through this particular theme. 
But today's message is, is a little challenging from a preaching perspective because chapter 9 really comes to us as one unit. It's one progressing logical argument, if you will. But because of time constraints, we're not going to be able to take on the entire chapter in one sitting here, here today. And so, we're, obviously, we're going to handle the first 14 verses here today, and then we'll handle the last part of the second half of the chapter next week. But the, the thing that's challenging for me as, as a preacher is that the real meat of chapter 9 is in the second half. But we have to deal with the, the context and, and the foundation of the first half first. So, um, so that's what we're doing today. So bear with me. This, this is sort of a, a teaching uh, week, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of the bigger um, issues next week as we go along. But if you have a Bible, I do encourage you to, to open it to this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, maybe you have a, a Bible app on your smartphone I know that, that, that Mimi just read the Scripture for us, and, and it's going to be on the screen at various times when I refer to some of these verses, but, um, but there's a lot in here, and I just would encourage you to be able to have it open, to be able to see what the Scriptures are saying as we, as we unpack this together. Um, I also want to say, too, just right out of the gate, that this is not a message about stewardship, okay? This is not me trying to sneak in this thing about money uh, on you. Um, the topic that, that Paul is, is talking about here is about stewardship. It does talk a lot about stewardship and particularly supporting those who preach the gospel to us. But really, this is just the illustration that Paul is using to illustrate the bigger point about putting the, the, the rights and the well-being of others above his pursuit of his own rights. His point really is to say, I'm not just asking you to apply this principle in your life as it relates to the eating of meat sacrificed to idols. I'm also letting you know that I'm applying the same principle in my own life and ministry by putting your well-being above my own rights. But it, but it happens to be this issue of financial support from those to whom he is ministering that is this example. Now, many of us may remember if you go back to last spring when we, when we studied the first seven chapters of this letter that Paul has written to the church in Corinth, that the relationship between Paul and the church in Corinth is a little bit strained. Paul came to Corinth. God sent Paul to Corinth to preach the gospel to them, and he began preaching the gospel. And many people heard the gospel, and they responded by putting their faith in Christ. And God told Paul to stay in that city for an extended period of time because God had many people that, that he had that were, that were going to come to faith in Christ and that he wanted Paul to minister to. So according to Acts chapter 18, Paul stayed in Corinth for about a year and a half. And, and if you follow Paul's life, you know that staying in one place for a year and a half was actually a pretty long stay for Paul partly because a lot of the places he, he went to, he was, you know, kind of booted out of the city, and a couple of times he was stoned. In fact, when he, when he came to Corinth initially, he was dragged out of the city, and he was stoned and left for dead. And, and God said, I want you to go back in, because I have more work for you to do. And, and as you might imagine, Paul responded by saying, you sure about this? But he, he followed. He, he followed and he trusted the Lord and he stayed there and he ministered for a year and a half. And so Paul was the founding pastor of this church in Corinth. But when Paul left, because Paul called, God called Paul to go preach the gospel in other places, there were other, other leaders who came in behind Paul and continued to lead the church. We know that Apollos was there for a time sort of serving as their pastor. There, are, there have been other leaders who have come in um, seemingly from more of a Jewish background who have followed and, and, and also led the church. Some people apparently have, have sort of criticized Paul's ministry. Some of those who have come after him, they have challenged some of his theology. They have criticized 
some of his communication style. They have criticized some of his lack of philosophical abilities in, in contrast to some other leaders. And, and then others have even questioned his apostleship. So there's, there's a lot that, that we have already seen in this letter that sort of reflects a defensiveness on Paul's part. He's, he's defending himself. He's trying to justify his ministry and, and his apostleship to these people. And, and we'll continue to see some of that defensiveness show up from time to time as we continue to walk through this letter. But the main purpose of this letter is not merely for Paul, or I'm sorry, the main purpose of this chapter is not merely for Paul to defend his ministry. His primary focus here is to illustrate that he himself is striving to live by the same principle that he's just called them to live by, this whole idea of putting the well-being of others above the exercise of our own rights. And so here's the example of how, how Paul is striving to live by the same principle. Although, the, although he has the right to request that the people in the church in Corinth would support him materially because they are the people who have benefited from his ministry, Paul has not exercised that right. In fact, he has been unwilling to receive any material or financial support from them. And in these 14 verses, it, it's, sort of, it's sort of a little bit of a backward argument here, but in these 14 verses, Paul lists six reasons for why he ought to be able to make that request of them. And so we're going we're gonna to unpack these, these reasons. A couple of them will go in a little deeper. Most of them will just kind of touch on, on a very surfacey level. But reason number one, that Paul should legitimately be entitled to receive financial and material support from the Corinthians is that he is an apostle. And this is obviously one of these points that Paul is really passionate about making with them. In the first six verses, Paul fires off seven rhetorical questions that are all intended to have obvious answers that build this argument for his apostleship. The first question he asks is, am I not free? Okay, of course Paul is free. The idea is that, that if these Corinthians are free in Christ, then certainly Paul, who led them to faith in Christ, he too also is free. This, the next question he asks is, am I not an apostle? We've already seen that this is a question that Paul feels the need to prove. And so, to, in his attempt to prove his apostleship, he fires off two more questions. He says, have I not seen Jesus the Lord? One of the, the credentials for apostleship is that the apostles were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we know from Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 18, and Acts chapter 22 that Paul had personal encounters with the risen Christ, where not only did he see Jesus, but Jesus also commissioned him to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. So that's the first proof that he offers here of his apostleship. And then he has asked really quickly another question. Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? According to the Scriptures, who has to work in someone's life in order for someone to come to, f to faith in Christ? Well, we're a Presbyterian church. If you've been here very long, you know that we believe that if the Holy Spirit is not working in someone's heart... Then, then someone will not come to put their faith in Jesus. The reason that people come to faith in Jesus isn't because they're smart. In other words, the difference between people who have faith and the people who don't have faith isn't that the people who have faith are smarter. It's that God is doing something in their heart by His Holy Spirit. And so if Paul is the one who has proclaimed the gospel to them, Therefore, it was his message that they are responding to, and people only respond when the Holy Spirit is at work, then what does that reveal about Paul's ministry? Paul seems to be making the argument that, that it demonstrates that he is filled with the Spirit, that the Spirit is working through his ministry. 
And so he's basically saying, listen, there may be people who might question or deny my apostleship, but you can't because your lives, your faith in Christ, your now walking with Christ is, is evidence of the fact that God has used my ministry in your life. Your very lives testify to my apostleship, he says. And so he says, this is my defense. This is my, my support for the authenticity of my apostleship. And then from there, he says, and if I am an apostle, and, and, I, and I'm telling you that I am, then don't I have legitimate rights as an apostle? For example... Don't I have the right to food and drink? Not, he's, he's not just saying that I have the right to food and drink, you know, to, to eat what I want and drink what I want. But, but what he's really saying is, don't I have the right to receive that food and drink from you, from those to whom I minister? And then he, he elaborates on it. This is, I, I, don't, I don't think this is, comical at all, but, but you, can, you can see that there's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek element to his argument here because he says, and don't I also have the right to have a wife who would travel with me in ministry as the other apostles do? Or, or is it that only Barnabas and I are the only ones who, who don't? Because it would appear that Paul and Barnabas don't have wives. He's really saying the only difference between me and the other apostles is that they have wives and I don't. But if I did, wouldn't it also be appropriate that you would support her as well? So that's, that's really his, his logic as he's unfolding this defense of his apostleship and his, and his building of the argument for why it would be appropriate that they would support him financially and materially in his ministry. And the answer... The, the cumulative answer to all of this is, of course, Paul has these rights. He's an apostle. That's reason number one for why it would be appropriate for them to support him. Reason number two, this will go a little faster here. Reason number two is that it's customary for laborers to be paid. In verse 7, he says, who serves as a soldier at their own expense? The answer, no one. Who plants a vineyard without eating some of the fruit? Or who, plant, who tends a flock without getting some of the milk from the flock? The answer to all these questions is no one. It's reasonable to, to expect that when you labor, then you, you get compensated. Reason number three, it's consistent with the Old Testament law. In verses 8 through 11, he, he fires off a bunch, bunch of other kind of questions. He says, do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is that about ox? Is that, is that about the ox truly? No, he said, that's not really about the ox. That's, that's an analogy. That's really speaking about people. This certainly is for our sake. It is written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher should thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. And so if we, and by we, I think he's referring to himself and Barnabas, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much that we would reap materially from you? The answer would be, the implicit answer is no, that would not be inappropriate at all. Reason number four, the Corinthians have supported other ministers like this, other laborers like this. In the first part of verse 12, he says, if others share this rightful claim on you, then do we not even more? I mean, you can see his logic here. If, if, other, if, the, if the pastors of your church after me you were, were supported by you materially, well, then why wouldn't we have been? At least, why wouldn't, have we, why wouldn't we have had the opportunity or the right to request that? Reason number five, supporting clergy is universally accepted. 
In verse 13, he says, Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? This, is not, this was not only true in the Old Testament of the Levitical priests in Israel, but as we saw last week, this is also true in the pagan temples. This is true in the, in the, in the pagan temples right there in Corinth where these people live. We, we talked about this last week in the context of this meat sacrifice to idols. Part of the reason why it was so difficult to avoid eating this meat sacrifice to idols is because a third of the meat of, of these burnt offerings in these pagan temples were burned on the altar, but a second third was, was given to the priests in those temples, and then a third third was kept by the people who brought the offering. Well, in, in the case of the priests, the priests had more meat than they knew what to do with. And so, very, very typically, that meat was then sold publicly in the market, and the priests would get the money as profit. But meat that had been sacrificed to idols was, was all over the culture. It was all, all, all through the society. And so, if you ate meat that you purchased at the store, at the market, or if you ate meat at someone's house, then very likely you were going to eat meat that had been sacrificed to an idol. And so, but, but the point is that this was not an unusual concept. This was, this was a very well-accepted concept in all of the culture around them. And then reason number six, Jesus ordained it. Paul says in verse 14, in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Just as one example of this from Luke chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, Jesus, he, he sends the apostles out, and this is what he says to them. He says, whatever house that you enter, first say peace to this house. Basically, he says, when you, when you approach a home and you speak to the people who live there, greet them by saying shalom, peace be with you. And if a son of peace is there, in other words, if someone welcomes you in, and they, give, they extend their peace to you, then, then your peace will rest upon them. But if not, that your peace will return to you. But, but listen to what he goes on to say in verse 7. He says, remain in that same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves their wages. And then this is a little bit funny to me. Do not go from house to house. That's just simply a commentary to the apostles to say, don't go looking around for better food. You know, if you, if you go to someone's house and they take you in and they provide you lodging and food and drink, then be content with what they provide you. Don't, don't look around and say, oh, there's a nicer house across the street. Stay in that place. Don't go from house to house. But you can see here, Jesus is saying it's appropriate for those who preach the gospel to receive the support from those to whom they minister. So, by all accounts, if you take all of these six reasons all together, Paul has a right to request material and financial support from those to whom he is ministering. But look at the second half of verse 12. In the second, he starts verse 12 by saying, if others share this rightful claim on you, do, do we not even more? But he goes on now and he says, nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Essentially what he's saying is, I would put up with just about anything so as not to hinder the ministry of the gospel. And so part of this is that he has not made use of this right. And so, so think about this logically, okay? If, if supporting the minister is a biblical concept, and, and it seems to be, would Paul then be in the right to teach this principle to them and then to call them to apply it. I think, I think based on everything we've seen here, that would be appropriate. In fact, what, what seems to be God's provision for taking care of the needs of those who are called to, to preach the gospel? It seems to be that those who benefit from the ministry support the preacher. 
So if the people are not supporting Paul and Barnabas, and he has not taught them this principle, and he has not called them to live by this principle, could we make the argument that Paul has no one to blame for this but himself? And he says that. He says, I don't want you to support me financially. I have not imposed this on you. I don't want to impose this right. Why? Well, the reason that he seems to be giving is what does it communicate to irreligious people when preachers preach the message of God's free grace through the death of Jesus Christ freely given on the cross and then turns right around and asks them for their money? What does that communicate to people? Do you see how that creates sort of a conflict almost a conflict of interest. I think this is why we live in a time when so many people are cynical about preachers. They're cynical about Christianity in many ways. Because on one hand, they hear about this grace. They hear about this mercy. They hear about this good news that is free. And yet we can't separate that from the fact that it seems like Every time we go to church or every time we turn on a TV show and there's a preacher on, they're always asking for our money. And it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths, doesn't it? I remember, that this is, for some of you, this is going to be totally unrelatable, but back in the 90s, <laughs> there was even a country song, a very, a very popular country song by Mary Chapin Carpenter, and some of you were like, oh yeah, I remember her, and some of you were like, Who? But, but she, she had this song, and, and at one point, one of the verses in the song, it talks about how she's, she's got the TV on, and some televangelist comes on, and she, reverse, she refers to him as having brimstone in his throat. And, and she basically summarizes his message like this. It's, he's offering salvation in exchange for my personal check. And her response is, I flipped the channel, and I'm now watching CNN. I think that's a perfect summary of the way that many people in our culture think about preachers. Yeah, you got this message. You got this message about good news. You got this message about avoiding hell and all those things, and it could be yours. And oh, by the way, here's the offering plate, right? Do you see the principle that we're getting at here, that Paul is getting at here? There are means and there are ends. The supporting of the preacher is not an end. It's a means. The supporting of the preacher is not the goal. My goal as your pastor cannot be to make a living Supporting me financially is a means to a bigger end, and the bigger end is that people will hear the gospel and that, that, that people will, will grow spiritually and that the Word of God will be proclaimed. By the, but but, but here's, the, here's the issue. When we're preaching the gospel to people who don't yet know the Lord, to turn around and ask them for financial support is a real disconnect. By the way, this is why we have missionaries, and it's why we support missionaries. You just, you just met Craig and Ree as they came up here, and some of you have known them a long time, and some of you are, are just seeing and hearing about their ministry for the first time. Why do we support them? They're preaching the gospel in Japan. Why don't they get the people in Japan to support them? It's for this reason. It's because if they preach the gospel to these non-believing people in Japan and say, and oh, by the way, as you consider this gospel, would you please give us money, that totally disconnects the grace from something else that they just don't know how to put together. And so we support them, along with other churches and other Christians, support their ministry so that when they go and preach the gospel to people who don't yet know the Lord in Japan, they don't have to confuse the issue by asking them to support them. Because they're putting the well-being of the people above their right 
to require it or to request it. And so we've said, look, we're happy to do it. We're happy to provide that support for you so that as you preach the gospel to people, you don't have to, to introduce that awkward confusion. That people would hear, that people would be changed by the gospel. That's the goal. That's the end. This may be very painful or difficult for some of us to think about, but our rights are not the end. Our rights are not the goal. Our rights are always the means. And the minute that, we exer that the exercise of our rights starts to, to threaten and interfere with the end, that's the minute that we ought to, do, to consider giving up our rights. I think the reason that Paul was able to forego the exercising of his rights in this particular area is because he understood that the Corinthians were not his provider. Ultimately, the Corinthians were not his provider. Who is his provider? God's his provider. Now, does God use means? Yes, he does. But because he knew that ultimately God was his provider, he was able to, to look at the situation and say, I'm willing to forego my rights because my trust is in the Lord. By the way, just as a, as a little sidebar here, let me just say that what we're talking about here is not being okay when your rights are trampled on. Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to teach this principle that if, if someone is abusive to you, that that's just okay. I'm not saying that. I don't think the Bible says that. We're talking about in the context of, of the greater good of other people being willing to surrender our rights for them, for their benefit, or, or in service to the greater goal, to see our rights as a means, not the end. If Paul's trust, though, had been in the Corinthians and not in God, if he had said, well, the, the Corinthians are, are my hope for having having a living, being able, to, being able to take care of myself, well, then he would have been relentlessly pursuing the money that he felt that they owed him. But that's not what he was doing. Here's, that's the principle, okay? Here's the question for us. as we, you know, We're starting to, to take the turn now toward what we're going to look at next week. And so, but I just want to kind of give you a couple of seeds to plant for for your thinking. Where in your life are your rights becoming the end? Where in your life are your rights becoming the goal and not a means to a greater goal? In other words, where are your rights being elevated in your life above the well-being of others? Is it in your marriage? Because I can tell you that that's not hard to do. It's not hard for me to do. To put my rights above the well-being of my wife. Is it in your family? Your, some of you are parents. Some of you are children. How hard is it to put your rights above the well-being of your kids or kids? How hard is it to put your well-being or your rights above the respect and the well-being of your parents? See, we, when that happens, here's how you know it's happening. You start to be demanding. You start to have tantrums. You start demanding your rights. Where in your life does that happen? Maybe it's at work. It's, you know, the well-being of my coworker would, would have me do this, but this is my right. I'm not, you know, I'm not moving. Maybe it's on a team that you're a part of, a work team, an athletic team, 
some, some other kind of group that you're involved with among your friends. Maybe it's at school. Where in your life are your rights becoming the end? They're becoming the goal. See, Paul didn't just call us to do this. He, he didn't just say to the church in Corinth, I'm giving you this principle that I want you to live by, but I'm not going to live by. No. He says, I'm living by the same principle. He modeled it because his hope and his trust were not in his rights, but his hope and his trust were in the Lord. If you don't trust God when it comes to your rights, then your rights will become your God. Let me say that again. If you're not trusting God when it comes to your rights, then your rights will become your God. If you're having trouble trusting God, my hope is that next week's message will, will be used by God to help you to grow in your trust in Him. Among other things, we're going to look at how many rights God was willing to let go of in order to willingly send His own Son to die for us. How many rights Jesus, the eternal Son of God, let go of in order to be willing to freely come and give His life for us? Not just that, but then to pursue us with His redeeming love. You know, it's not just that He sent His Son and Jesus died and He said, okay, my work here is done, do what you will with Him. But no, He sends His Spirit and He pursues us. He sends preachers to pursue us. Not because these are about God's rights, it's because He is putting our well-being in the forefront. We'll look at that a little bit more next week. Let's pray as we close. Thank you, Lord, for calling us, for, for teaching us about what it is for us to put the well-being of others, to put the causes of your kingdom, the preaching of the gospel above our rights. Lord, I, I confess, I can't confess for everyone, but I can confess for myself that it is so easy for me to want to exalt my rights and my pursuit of my rights above everything else because they're my right and I think I'm owed them. But Lord, if, if that's what you had done, then, then we would not be here. There would be no such thing as salvation. There would be no such thing as grace from you. You set aside your own glory, your own rights, and you willingly came to live and to die for us. You've given us Paul's example here in this letter of how while it was his right to be supported financially from the church in Corinth, he, he set that right aside so that their embracing of the gospel would not be confused by his request for money because that was in their well-being. Lord, help us to, to look at our lives and to see where is it, where are the places, what are the relationships where we are putting our rights above the good, the well-being of others. Lord, would you show us those areas, and by your grace, would you help us to have a willingness, where appropriate, to set our rights aside so that others can be served. We ask for your help. Thank you for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Let's respond by singing of the matchless love of Christ.